Today we're talking with Michael Nissen. He is a TRE trainer that puts a lot of extra focus on the eyes and facial expressions. So that's what we're going to talk about today. TRE, it's back! Along with the eyes, reading the eyes, using the eyes, together with tools like TRE to remove our trauma, but also... (coughs) I need some freaking TRE in my mouth. Here we are with Michael Nissen. I want to get into eyes and eye movements for the purpose of um, changing our nervous system, understanding our, our body and mind. But before we get there, let's sort of set the groundwork and, and learn more about you, um, the kind of work you're doing, the philosophies and things that have um, kind of inspired you to do the work that you're doing. So let's start with that. Um, talk about Wilhelm Reich at first, because from what I understand, he he was sort of a big early influence that came even before the bioenergetic stuff and the TRE for you. So why Wilhelm Reich? Why is that even relevant to, to what we're talking about today? Yeah, uh, he was an early influence for me, but also for body oriented psychotherapy because he was the one who founded it. Almost all kind of body oriented psychotherapies are reactions uh, continuing his work or contribution with other things uh, to his work so uh, it makes sense to go back to him and also he had a lot of emphasis on the eyes in his work and I think that's quite forgotten in our time that he had so much emphasis working on the eyes and why he had it so Wilhelm Reich he was a pupil of Sigmund Freud and he was a very ambitious man but he was also very impatient. So sitting, making psychoanalysis, uh, talking with clients only, uh, not even looking at them, and they couldn't see you, uh, so there was almost no contact. And uh, he could see that you didn't have good enough results working like this, and it also didn't fit to, to his way of being. So... When he was analyzing people in psychoanalysis, he saw that people had somatic reactions. So he thought, if you can go from the psych to the soma, meaning if you can talk through a talking cure, have some bodily reaction, maybe it's more effective to go through the body to the psych instead of the other way around. So he had people lying down. They were already lying down. But then he told them to start breathing, which was a revolution in psychotherapy, because until that, you were only talking. You, you, you saw bodily reactions, but you didn't tell people to go more into the body or to do something with the body. So just doing that was a, a big contribution to psychotherapy. And then through uh, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, where he was working with the body, he he developed all kind of techniques to improve his work and in the end he uh, he worked very systematically starting with working with the eyes and then working down through the body so the eye eye work was not only loosening tension it was also a way of improving the ability for contact in the eyes It was uh, working with the ability to express emotion through the eyes. And then when that started working, uh, he moved down through the the body. Of course, nowadays you can see that as a little rigid or a little maybe too orthodox way of working. So today most people, they work in all kinds of ways. Uh, But what I can see in body oriented psychotherapy is that there's too little focus on the eyes then you have some new techniques where you have a lot of focus on the eyes but it's not really connected to uh, to the traditions of body oriented psychotherapy then it gets more like a pure somatic uh, method working with trauma for example so you must have been a teenager or something and you stumbled upon this book and how how did how did it change you personally it sounds like it kind of lit some spark inside you that led you down this this path of bioenergetics and TRE and all this other stuff. It's what it sounds like. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. What what was it 
about Wilhelm Reich's methods and philosophies that kind of got you all excited about it? Yeah, first off, actually, it was a, a more an intellectual curiosity because in high school, I was I was writing a, a paper about evilness in human beings, uh, the origin of evilness and aggression. So I read all the psychological theories about it, and Wilhelm Reich's theory was what made most sense for me. Some of the theories were quite strange to me, and his, his was very simple that if you suppress the aggression in human beings, you will have destructiveness, of course. If you su suppress the feelings of a child, you will have irrational behavior. So this very simple, down-to-earth way of thinking about psychology and emotions made immediately sense for me. Okay, then naturally, you, you didn't intend on that getting into this bodywork stuff, but you got more and more interested, and then that kind of led you down this um, more body-oriented path, right? So tell, tell us about that. Yeah, so when I was around 19, I had some problems, and I wanted to go in psychotherapy, and I checked out the different offers here in Denmark, which is a small country, and it was back in the 80s, so we didn't have that much uh, methods to and people to choose from. And, um, and then I chose... Uh, bioenergetic therapist who was also educated by some of Wilhelm Reich's pupils. So I started with 19 in uh, in this kind of bioenergetic Wilhelm Reich body-oriented psychotherapy. And it made a lot of change quite quickly. But for most of us, of course, it's a long-term work if you want to change something fundamental. Okay. And eventually you became a first your PE teacher um, but then you then you went back to school and you and you became a, a licensed clinical psychologist and yes a bioenergetic therapist yeah. and later a Terry trainer. What what kinds of people do you help or have you helped? Um, talk about the kinds of people that you're that you're working with or ha have worked with. Yeah, so um, I started having my praxis uh, in Denmark. Uh, working just with the people who called me, who wanted body-oriented psychotherapy. And often that was, was people who had been in talking therapy before, and they had good effect from that, and they knew themselves better after that. They understood their problems better, but they didn't feel that they had enough effect of it, so they want to go deeper. And for them, then it made sense to have the body along. So they called me. Then I moved to uh, to Germany, to Berlin, and stayed there for five years. And there also I worked with psychiatric patients uh, with body-orientated psychotherapy. And there also I had my private practice in Berlin for 10 years, which was an interesting period of my life because I worked with people from both former West and East Germany. Uh, so there, of course, I work with many people with family histories connected to uh, to the to the Second World War and to the communist period uh, with the communist dictatorship and all the consequences of that, and many other themes. So that was was a very interesting period. Then I moved back to Denmark and uh, I got a job as a psychologist in the Danish Society for Multiple Sclerosis, which is a patient organization for people with multiple sclerosis. And I picked this job because I wanted, of course, to help these people uh, with psychological offers, but also because I thought it would be interesting to see if I, with my body-orientated psychotherapeutic methods, could influence a central nervous system disease. Because here you had a disease where the central nervous system was attacked. The immune system attacks the central nervous system. And that means you get more and more damages in the brain and in the spinal cord and in the vision nerve. And if these methods could improve the conditions of these people, then we had a proof that we are able with these methods to influence the central nervous system. So 
that was very attractive to me to see if that would be possible. So I worked there for 12 years with uh, bioenergetics and then later with TRE with more than uh, more than 1,000 people with multiple sclerosis. What is bioenergetics? Yeah. So bioenergetic was founded by a medical doctor from the United States called Alexander Lovon. He was one of Wilhelm Reich's main pupils. So you could say he is second generation of body-oriented psychotherapy. He was born in 1910 and died in 2008, so 98 years old. And he had a lot of very important contribution to body-oriented psychotherapy. He made a lot of different exercises uh, which you could use to get more life in the body, to get more expression in the body. And he had the concept of grounding uh, that he said it's very important that we also work with the ability of the body to be grounded, connected to earth. And he saw that also as an emotional, uh, psychological phenomena. The more you are connected to, to the ground, the more also you are connected to your own and the world's reality. So this is one of his contributions. But also he had all these different kind of exercises you can use within these, this method. So I'm educated in his method in bioenergetic analysis in Germany. And and the next generation after Alexander Lohn, of course, there are many different directions there. And one of them is TRE, which stands for Tension and Trauma Releasing Exercises. This is founded by David Bacelli. And the reason he made this method was because he saw that there were so many methods which were very sophisticated and complicated, and you had to take a long education, you had to go in the therapy for a long period to have effect. And he saw you have so many groups of people around the world who are so traumatized and where it's not realistic that you will have therapists uh, to treat all these people in areas of civil war and natural catastrophe. And as we see now, the situation in Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Palestine, we get all the time more and more traumatized people. And it's a minority of these people who will ever have therapy. And they really need it. So what he thought was, if we could take all this stuff from Wilhelm Reich and from Alexander Lohn, and make it very, very simple, so we can implement it much quicker in areas of, uh, of trauma big population being traumatized, this could be really attractive. So his big contribution is not making new techniques or making a new complicated theory or, or praxis. His great cont contribution to trauma therapy is to make a very simple method, which only is seven exercises, which makes your body vibrate to to let out uh, the tension created by trauma and stress. And this is now being used in 80 or 90 countries around the world by thousands of people. And it's really effective. It's not psychotherapy. It's more like a somatic therapy, which helps when you have trauma or stress or other uh, psychological problems. For me, that was attractive because uh, when I worked in the Danish Society for Multiple Sclerosis as a psychologist, I only had three to five hours uh, for each client. So I couldn't do long-term therapy with so many people. Uh, it was not possible economically. Uh, so having a method which you could very quickly learn your clients and then they could continue to do it at home as a self-help tool was very attractive to me. So even though I thought I had already enough education, uh, I thought this, is, this makes sense to take this also because I can use it here. So I took that also in Germany 
and assisted David Bacelli on education in, in Poland. And then I started using it in Denmark uh, with people with multiple sclerosis. And we could see some of my colleagues also took the education and uh, we could see a lot of different improvements with this uh, group of clients. So with many people, it was you were able to make the central nervous system more balanced and in this way decrease symptoms. So this is a short story of these methods. <laughs> is the TRE the was that the most powerful tool for these people with multiple sclerosis or how did that change them in general or in, in some specific cases? Um, and two, what are some other uh, methods that you noticed really helped with, um, I guess we'll focus on multiple sclerosis for now. Yeah. So first of all, uh, because the disease is the autoimmune system attacking the central nervous system uh, and the central nervous system gets more and more damages, you will see all kinds of symptoms in these disease. And what we could see was, for example, a symptom which is very stressful for people and it's difficult to treat with medicine, uh, is spasticity, which means that you get cramp conditions in muscles around the body. And people, they cannot sleep because they wake with cramp in the leg and it's very, very painful. And uh, some also go into like convulsive cramp movements. So it can be very painful and complicated symptom. And there we saw with some people that after two, three months doing TOE, which means that the body vibrates spontaneously by itself, these cramp conditions decreased a lot. And some people could even stop taking medicine for cramp. And other people just were able to sleep better because they didn't wake up with cramp. And it's very attractive to, to be able to stop taking these uh, medicines against, against symptoms because they always have side effects, which makes the situation even more complicated. So this was one symptom. We had some people, they had to go up and pee in the night five times because it also influenced the connection to the bladder. And after doing TRE for two, three months, they had to go up and pee one time a night, which of course has a great influence on the everyday life quality, uh, that you are more fresh when you wake up, you had a better sleep. Some people had in increased ability for balance, for gait. Some people, they got more energy. Uh, in one of our scientific studies, we could show, for example, one woman, she was very, very tired before doing theory. And then after two months, she had so much energy, she cleaned the whole house. <laughs> <laughs> so, but of course you have to do it. So if, if you don't do the exercises, then you don't want, you won't have so much effect. And that's also why it can be quite difficult to uh, to show the effect in scientific studies. And also, it's different from people to people how they are affected and how easy it is to, to improve their condition. And it's not a miracle tool. You cannot make the central nervous system whole again. So it is destroyed parts of the central nervous system. But bringing the body back in balance bringing the central nervous system more in balance, we can see that by some people, this can have a great effect on, on their condition. I work with the one person, and I can tell this story, frankly, because she has been in, in media in Denmark many times, also on television. And she came to me when she was 60 years old, and she had already retired as a school teacher because she was so influenced by multiple sclerosis and after around two years her symptoms were almost almost gone and she did theory two times a day and then she took the education as a theory trainer and now she is getting close to 70 i guess and she is uh, 
working in two physiotherapy practices and now she should be normally she would retire at this age but she is so fond of working and have so much energy now that she wants to continue to work so it sounds like a big key back into this sort of healthy regulated nervous system where we're not stuck in the sympathetic mode for too long uh, we're not trapped in this trauma anymore is movement it's 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 movement right and yeah. with TRE yeah. It's kind of a strange kind of movement because you're basically kind of holding yourself in a, a certain position for however long, and then these spontaneous movements start happening. You're not doing the movement. You're not thinking, I'm going to move this way, left, right, up, down, whatever. And it sort of has a seeming kind of random a randomness to it. Like, I, I don't know, it's not forward or back or left and right. It's kind of, it's just crazy shaking, right? And maybe you've noticed some sort of um, pattern there, but we're not deliberately choosing those kinds of of movements but wh why is it that these movements are even um doing anything because on the surface you're like okay well we move a lot of times throughout the day and we're still traumatized and we're still uh stuck in a sympathetic state but what's different about these these spontaneous movements from tre why how, how does that even um how's that different several things first of all what i noticed when people do tre I'm always very curious if people lear learned it from a video on the internet. So uh, people, they come to my practice, they show me how they do TRE. And mostly uh, I see that they do TRE in a way that confirms their problem. And of course they do that unconsciously, but it's just so interesting to see again and again, people using a really effective method but in a way doing it which exactly confirms the problem they have. And it makes sense that they have no idea how to do it in, a, in another way because uh, you have to know quite a lot about the body and about uh, psychological issues and so on not to do that. But then they go to a provider, a TRE provider, and this provider can help them to change some of the positions and in this way get a more harmonious process where you feel that you get better for example a person who who is depressed uh, i see again and again this person who has too little energy will do the exercises in a way which doesn't increase the level of energy in the body or a person who is uh, overwhelmed by trauma and is in a state of overexcitement will do the theory, even the spontaneous movements, the person will do in a way which keeps uh, the excitement too high. So even though it's a very simple method, we all need guidance to find a way to uh, get more in balance using the method. Is it about like just letting go and that they're trying to control it too much or why isn't it working in those cases? I think it's because it has to do with habits that we are so used to being in our body in the way we are. So uh, the depressed person is used to being depressed, feels maybe even secure being depressed. And uh, the overexcited person has some unconscious attractions to high energy levels, which in a way confirms a problem. So for me, it's just interesting to see if I can help the person do it in another way, which balance the central nervous system and the rest of the body. Are your methods for teaching these people different? In, I'll, I'll put two cases. One case where the person's kind of depressed they don't have enough energy to get up and get going they're not sympathetic enough um and then yeah. the other side is someone who's really um aroused i'm not talking about sexually aroused but they're really uh energetic and they're yeah. a bit uh, yeah. uh, almost manic or something like that right so there's too much energy and not enough energy is there a different sort yeah. of strategy um for how to do tre for these two different extremes yes a lot of different kind of nerdy uh, changing of positions in the way you do the exercises. And some of them are very subtle. But the other thing is, uh, which is as, as important, is the person understanding the tendencies. 
and the reason why they are doing it like this and going into uh, alternatives, trying out, alter- experimenting with other uh, alternatives and feeling this effect. We're, we're going to get away from TRE pretty soon, I think. I, I want to get into some yeah. more uh, deliberate movements, but yeah. we're going to yeah. let's talk about these spontaneous movements a little bit more. Is it mainly in the in sort of this uh, abdominal region? Is that where you're kind of shaking? Are there any other regions where we can use TRE? Like, uh, I, I've never seen it done like with the face. I don't know if we could do it with the face. Could we maybe do it with our legs or our arms? How, how, how far do, how far can we shake, or where where can we where can we activate this? Um, yeah, but. What are the options for TRE? <laughs> yeah, so so in theory, for many, it starts in the abdominal and the pelvis area, uh, in the legs and the pelvis area, because we have so much emphasis on the psoas muscle, which connects on the inner tights and move up uh, through the pelvis and to the lower back and, and the diaphragm. So... It's natural that it starts there, but the idea is that the vibrations and also we see spontaneous stretching and convulsive movements through the body, that all these different kind of movement phenomena that they spread out in the whole body. And when you ask about the head and the face, uh, then we we are at this area with the eyes also that I see people uh, shaking and the body looks really free it looks nice and you think whoa it's there's a lot going on here but then you look at the face and it's totally pale or uh, the eyes they look totally dull so i think why is why is that it why are the face and the eyes not corresponding with with what is going on in the body in the rest of the body uh, so that's one of my interest um, areas uh, to see if we can have uh, the expression of the face, movements of the face and the eyes more along. We also see many people who lie and shake with closed eyes and they they have the feeling they can shake better in this way. But I'm afraid that they are not connected uh, to, maybe they feel connected to themselves, but not so much to the outer world. And also, I cannot see how much are the eyes along in this process. It's almost like it's harder to reach the face or something like the face, the facial habits, the way we move our mouth and our eyes are even more fixed. And uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, to- I totally agree because it can be more vulnerable. Uh, it has to do with expressing ourselves. Uh, it has to do with being seen. It has to do with taking impressions in. And all of us, this we have already from Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lohn, uh, all of us experienced so many things in our childhood where uh, we start expressing less, where we start taking uh, less impressions in because it was... It was, it was threatening to us or we were uh, suppressed or well, our parents were nice people, but we could just feel they cannot take this level of emotion. So I have to withdraw a little bit because else uh, they will be overwhelmed with my emotions. And all these things we all have along. All these things are so much connected also to the face, of course, also the rest of the body. But in the face, this is where we have the early connection with our parents. And if you think about polyvagal theory, it also makes sense because according to that, we we went through the safe and social mode, and then we kind of get into fight mode, and then we get into flight mode, and then we get into freeze mode. So it's almost like the sort of polyvagal ladder where you have to first get out of the freeze, out of the depression, and then move up into the sort of this sympathetic running flight fight state and then how do people's faces look when they're running or when they're fighting they're pretty serious looking and they're not like smiling they're like you know like an animal or something and then i guess you sort of just then you move up and move up and eventually you get to this place where people are safe and social and they feel comfortable able to even activate those facial muscles um maybe something like that is going on as well so it just takes time and it's it's sort of like a after week 16 or whatever eventually they start smiling again or something is that is that 
Does that make sense from your experience or understanding? Or yeah, yeah, I I totally agree about everything you said until the the sixteen weeks, uh, because I have to go back to this with feeling safe about yeah. how you are, and just having a really good method doesn't mean that people will develop because we have to know mm. why they are not developing. We yeah. have to know why. Uh, why are the whole body so free, but they are still have no expression in the face or or they are still lying with closed eyes? So it doesn't necessarily just happen. Uh, also not in other methods. I also see when people do yoga that they ha- many people, they have really a lot of flow in, in the body and uh, it looks really good. But... But also there, sometimes I see that it, the face doesn't really come along. Uh, the expressions doesn't come along. There it has other reasons. Uh, you don't work with spontaneous movements in yoga. You don't work with expressing emotions in yoga. But still, also there you could think, if you just do yoga, everything will happen. Because it's such a good method. But that's just not what I see with everybody so that's why i think it's it's important to talk about how can we how can we uh, have the emotions more along and how can we have the expression more along including the face and the eyes and sometimes also you can see that uh, that there's a lot of flow in the body but but the face area it's like the flow doesn't get into the face yeah. uh, or into the head. And when you start re- releasing these areas, people, they can even say, oh, whoa, it feels really good inside yeah. my brain now. Medical doctors will think you're crazy because they don't think you can feel your brain. But yeah. but people are feeling their brain when, when you get more f- uh, fluid and blood flowing into the brain, it feels good. People, they they have the feeling, I feel more clear in my head now, now. I can see better. I feel more connected to the world and so on. Yeah, people might be saying, why why, why are you guys talking about the face for so long? What's, why, what, what's wrong with people's faces being frozen? And um, But if you think about it, even for a second, like <laughs> it seems it's very intuitive. You're like, well, it doesn't feel good. Ambulances. It doesn't feel good when your face is like, we do that when we're scared, when we're worried, when we're anxious, when we're when we don't feel safe, right? And you can feel it in your heart too. When your face is kind of yeah. moving freely, your heart is sort of feels to seem to be beating more slowly. Your brain, the, the energy is flowing. It all kind of just feels better yeah. when you're able to move your face. And so I I, I wanted to ask like, who yeah. cares? What's wrong with having a you know expressionless face? But I think we all know deep down inside. Um, yeah, when we have such a face and when we see someone with such a face, we don't feel safe around them. And then when we have such a face, we, we don't feel safe. We don't feel yeah. good. We don't feel creative or energetic or any of that. I, I guess, yeah, I don't, yeah. that's not even a question, but, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's good explanations. Yeah. It, it's good. A way, it's a good way of explaining it. And I totally agree. And answering your first question, why should we put so much emphasis on this? I think we are still stuck in this uh, split between the mind and the body and that this also got into psychotherapy and we can see it also. You have medicine and then you have psychology. This is already a split. So even a person like uh, Alexander Lone, who was a main pupil of Wilhelm Reich, who whose book was books was read by millions of people even he has a tendency to the split because he says you have to get from your head down in your body and this there unconsciously he is saying that the head is not part of the body of course i understand why he says it that we have to get more in the whole body but for me it's more connecting the head with the rest of the body and there also, I think the reason we I see this tendency in different methods not to have the head enough along, including the eyes, is because we're still stuck in this dilemma. I can't wait any longer. I want to get I want to get into this eye stuff. And maybe you're not 
not the guy for this, but I'm hoping yeah. that I'm hoping that you have some little tricks up your sleeve. Um, if not, then I'll I'll have to just hunt for them somewhere else. But um, yeah, so we have TRE. There's a spontaneous movements going on. Yeah, there's a certain way to you know position your body to elicit these movements. But what are some? Let's go to some other um, tools in the toolkit. I'm a big fan of sort of these eye movement exercises, moving our eyes in certain directions or uh, changing um, the way we're looking at things, our environment. There's a lot of different ways um, we can use our eyes as a kind of a, a, a tool to, to changing our nervous system. Do you agree with that kind of approach at all? Do you do anything like that? I agree with all of them. And I think it's good work. And and I think, for example, EMDR is a great contribution to psychotherapy and trauma work and also brain spotting and some of the other methods working with the eyes. So the way I work with the eyes is more connected to a more holistic way of, of, of working with eyes, connected to the rest of the body, connected to the emotional history of the person, not only to one traumatic event, but to the whole history. And there's a lot of things to talk about in this area. But, for example, one thing is the ability to show emotions through the eyes or the ability to take impressions in through the eyes, the ability to see wider. And there there are a lot of different techniques to work with. There's two guys I want to mention. One is called Will Davis. He is an American living in southern France, and he made a meth. He he is also pupil of Wilhelm Reich's pupils, and uh, he's very influenced by Wilhelm Reich. And his method is called functional functional analysis, and he works a lot with the movement inwards in the body. And I'm telling this to explain some of the ideas in the in the eye work. So, for example, he has an exercise where he works with the movement out through the eyes and the movement in through the eyes. And to understand his work, if you get a shock, it's like you have a movement in, you get a shock, and it's like something is moving inwards, like a fear reaction. The problem is that this movement stucks halfway, so you don't have the whole movement. It's like you get half a shock, but you 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 cannot allow the whole shock to move inwards, and that means you have a a phenomena also in the eyes of something moving inwards, but not getting all the way in. You have the same phenomena with expressing emotions that you express anger in your eyes, but it only gets half out. Uh, so it gets some of it gets stuck on the way out. So working with these movement, taking impressions in and expressing emotions f- through the eyes is for me very effective. It's some kind of like trauma in a way. It's like, some, like yeah. basically some, we had some experience of, of actually seeing something or experiencing something and sort of stopped midway. And, and these exercises are, completing that movement it's a it's, i've never heard of, i've never heard of this stuff before so can you explain it a little bit more yeah alexander lone explains in in one of his books and he also told it on a workshop i participated in that in his first session with wilhelm reich in the early 40s wilhelm reich he was uh, doing something uh, he was pulling his eyes down or, or the chin under the eyes he was pulling it down so Lone had got bigger eyes. And doing this, Lone suddenly saw his mother looking very angry at him, and he screamed. So this has an immense importance. How did our parents look at us? Which impressions did we see in our parents' eyes? And to go back to Stephen Porteous also, uh, was it loving eyes? Uh, was it eyes that made us feel safe? Or were they threatening all the time? Or were it, were it eyes without expression? People, uh, children, they, they get scared when, when they don't feel the emotions of their parents. And then they start closing down their own emotions. 
And all these things you can see in the, in the eyes. And all these things you can work with in the eyes. Oh, so just as we have this for these, these patterns in our body that um, TRE might help shake out or all these other things might reshake open, um, we kind of almost like have our parents' eyes or these these eyes of our, our grandparents or whoever, and they almost like become yeah. like rigid, fixed there. We didn't choose our eyes or our face, really. It was sort of thrown onto us by um, our past. And you're kind of yeah. showing people how to uh, kind of shake those pieces around and, and, and maybe take control over it themselves to be like, Oh, I, I don't have to get locked in, in this, in this space. I can open my range of expressions. Yeah, exactly. But it, it takes time and it, it's, uh, you need to, some of the emotions and some of the emotions, which was held back then in your childhood they have to be re-experienced and they have to be re-expressed mm -hmm. and also some of the things you experienced have to t be taken in again so it's this this work which slowly improves the ability of the eyes to express emotions um in europe if you are in northern Europe, people have much less expression in the eyes than they have in southern Europe. And and the more south you go in Europe, I was in Sicily this summer, uh, it's even in Italy, in northern Italy, they have less expression in the eyes than in, in southern Italy. I think the Italians would agree upon it. And I don't think it has anything to do with sun. I think it has to do with culture. Wow. Uh uh, and also, if you look at the whole world, it's so different how how much expression people have in the eye, how shiny they are, how much love they are able to express. The most expressive eyes I ever saw in my life was uh, when I was very young and I took a, a bus in, in Spain and uh, a gypsy father and his daughter came into the bus and they had so strong eyes and, and there was so much expression in the eyes and they looked fully open. And I don't think that has only to do with ethnicity. That would be strange. How should that be explained psycho uh, biologically? It has to do with that culture. It's You can hear it in their music also. You have much more emotions. The emotions are allowed to be much more alive. Does it have to do with freedom or like some sort of uh, control or uh, does this go back to the whole that philosophical stuff from Wilhelm Reich about destructiveness and aggression and all that? Or Yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to um, complain about certain cultures, but I think we all, well, actually some people, sometimes some people like cultures that are very kind of cold and emotionless. I don't um, tend to like being in such places, um, but I guess this depends on what, what's comfortable for you. Yeah, uh, it's it's not because I want to discriminate any cultures, but it's just so obvious to see the differences. And I think that some areas in the world would really have great advantages of being able to feel more and express more. And it can be that some of these cultures have other advantages, uh, which are good, of course. But uh, in all areas of the world, we have many problems and they can be different from culture to culture but what i'm concerned about here is uh how alive is the person and which consequences do, does it get if if this aliveness is uh is suppressed and this starts in early childhood what are some kinds of eye exercises we can do to um i know maybe not immediately but eventually perhaps uh, increase our our energy yeah um it's difficult to to give exercises in a podcast uh right. also because it's so connected with with the whole method um but one thing of course is when you're doing body work to uh to be the, just to be aware of it i think is a strong exercise to be aware if you do yoga, if you do TRE, if you do other stuff, 
to be aware, is, is my face along in this process? Are my eyes along in this process? Or uh, did I blend out this area and am I only occupied with the rest of the body? Just this, I think, is a strong exercise, this awareness. Uh, so for you, it's, it's less about like, okay, let's do lateral eye movements. Let's do up and down. Let's do like near far. It's not about that. Yeah, those might work. Um, EMDR, et cetera. It's more about like doing the overall bodily um, embodiment exercises like like TRE, et cetera. And then just paying attention to to how the eyes are, are moving or not moving and, and um, just reading them and watching them and, and kind of learning them, kind of building a relationship um, with the eyes uh, of this a person. So it's about kind of reading the eyes and not necessarily like guiding them, go this way, go that way, but just being aware of how they're moving. Is that, is it more like that? Also, but also the other part. Uh, okay. So uh, I have hundreds of eye exercises. That's what I want. <laughs> uh, and and they, they make a lot of sense, but they yeah. are difficult to give uh, yeah. outside a context. Uh, so the last Eight years, I was a pupil of a Austrian psychologist called Bruno Adler. He is uh, 97 and he lives in uh, Sweden. And he's still traveling to Denmark and to Poland to teach his method. And he uh, he is also a pupil of Reich's pupils. And he put even more emphasis on the eyes than uh, the Russian pupils. So he works a lot with the eyes and also with many technical things. But the main point for him is using these techniques in contact. So he doesn't use the techniques mechanically. They are in a way mechanically, mechanic, but he only uses them in contact. Do you do any work uh, or pay any attention to things like blinking, uh pupil dilation not necessarily eye movements but i guess other parts of the eye like the eyelid or the pupil um and other parts um moving is that anything you think about at all yes a lot okay 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 great uh, about <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah so so um uh, with the blinking you can you can get more uh, loading you can get more fluid and energy in, into the area and in this way you can also get more emotional reactions uh, in the eyes and in the rest of the body so I work a lot with blinking and also with all kind of eye movements and then I'm also very occupied with a concept called binocular, binocular vision meaning that the eyes are, uh, are seeing exactly the same because most of us, we will have a tendency that one of our eyes is looking much more than the other. And the eye doctors, they know this phenomena also, but they don't connect it to emotional trauma. Uh, but this is what I learned from Bruno Adler. Uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on binocular vision, and that means he wants to reestablish the eye's ability to look equal. And the more emotional emotional you get the more pressure you feel the less uh, ability to binocular vision you will have because you start micro dissociate meaning you're not able to be totally focused because you start withdrawing or you start being re-traumatized or you start going into your tendency or whatever that makes sense because when we are really stressed for better or worse we tend to tense up our eye muscles and kind of focus in like really up close and you would imagine if you get stuck yeah. in sort of such a state um that 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 would perhaps cause some kind of eye damage even or a, a certain way of looking at yeah. the world and, and looking and at the other side if you're not maybe um you don't have enough energy that might get you stuck like in i don't know kind of like a little little la la land kind of kind of look on your face yeah. and yeah so is that kind of what's going on Yes, exactly. Uh, and so it can be that what you described, or it can be many other phenomena which you're able yeah. to see. You can also have people where you, where the person looks angry all the time, even when the right. person is happy. 
or the person looks fearful even in the most safe situation because the fear is so frozen in the eyes. And this is what I'm interested in, to try to release these emotional stuckness in the eyes and see how that connects to the rest of the body. The eyes are connected to the face and connected to the neck and it's all it's all connected, right? Um, have you found some certain kind of like little... Uh little parts i know i don't i don't like breaking the body up into parts but we we have language and this is how we how we kind of this is what we've got um for example like neck movements to change the eyes or i don't know weird little walking movements have you felt like that ah the eyes are really good friends with this other part of the body and if i kind of like move this piece around over here the eyes start lighting up or they start reacting or uh basically the eye the connection between the eyes and sort of other what I'm calling body parts, but I know they're it's all connected inside. I, I like the dilemma in your in your question because I totally agree that in a way we should we should see the body as a whole and not divide it. But there are also uh, great advantages in divide, dividing it, and and we see that also in other ways of working with the body in yoga and in Chinese medicine. They also divide the body. So yeah. uh, as long as we can look at it as a whole at the same time, I think it it makes sense. So, for example, I work with one client and I was allowed to describe this work also. And I work with her eyes and uh, and then she start crying. So the diaphragm start moving and this made the body, uh, the, the, the stomach move and and then suddenly her depression was gone uh, but this started with working with the with the eyes so i could see a connection to diaphragm and to the stomach here loosening these emotional stuckness in the eyes connected down through the body so just as one example another example is exactly what you describe uh, the neck that the neck we know also from Wilhelm Reich's work is very connected to the eyes. So this movement through the neck, up over the head, in through the brain, into the eyes, uh, there's a lot of connection. And uh, most of us has have a lot of uh, tension in the neck. You can also have people where you don't feel so much tension in the neck, but it's more like they are not charged in art in energetically in the neck so it's it's like it's flaccid uh, in this part of of the body and this you will be able to see in the eyes also so uh, neck work makes a lot of sense uh, when you work with the eyes are there any differences between doing eye eye work with the eyes open versus the eyes closed we, we we're almost assuming that it's it's eyes open but I can imagine some benefits to doing some sort of closed eye with your eyes closed and doing some sort of um, exercises with that. Yeah. Um, what I see is many people prefer to work with eyes closed. And I have, I'm in the opposite position because I want okay. to work with contact. I want to work with the ability for contact. It's like some people, they feel, I cannot feel myself, or I, I want to feel myself, I want to be in my world, and I, I don't feel myself if I have open eyes. But you can work with this dilemma also with open eyes. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't work with closed eyes. I, I like sometimes when I do exercises to close the eyes and feel what happens now when I have them closed. Yeah, I imagine especially if you start pairing it with other um, modalities or senses, for example. I know we don't want to overwhelm our system, but I can imagine uh, maybe we are doing some audio work along with the eye movement work. Um, I'm just kind of trying to think of an example. Maybe, like for example, maybe you're doing these like these bilateral beats, like kind of left, right, left, right, while yeah. the eyes are moving in a certain way, or I don't know, there's music going along. With that, I, I, I can I can definitely see why you might want to close your eyes. Do you ever pair the eye work with, say, something else like sound or smell or, I don't know, some something funky? Uh, I take eye work a lot into theory work also because in theory you don't have so much emphasis on the eyes. We have it, but not so much. 
So, and in theory, we are totally open to mixing theory with all kinds of other methods. So for me, it makes a lot of sense to take this Russian uh, I work and connect it to uh, to theory to uh, be able to have the head and the ability for expression and so on more along in, in the theory process. With the TRE, I, I, yeah, most people are probably, when they're watching someone do TRE, um, and you, you can watch it on YouTube if you want to see what it looks like if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Um, but like they're, we're probably looking at their their abdominal region where their psoas muscles are, and they're, it's shaking. But you're you're kind of like checking out their face and their eyes and saying, oh, whoa. Um, I, I see the TRE movement in, in sort of, um, I'm going to break it into two parts, but of course there's more than two parts. Um, one is like they're actually shaking. And at that point, it looks like they're kind of actually getting sympathetically aroused and they're getting activated. Um, I imagine yeah. that their face and their eyes are going to look different during the shaking, during the trimmering versus after the exercise, say after they've calmed back down or the next day or something. So have you noticed like a difference in the face? Of course, everyone's going to be different, but some sort of general yeah. um, trend in the face during the TRE shaking versus after it, uh, maybe it's minutes later, maybe it's days later. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm more occupied with what happens during the process. If, if they have the same expression as they had when they came in the door, uh, when they shake, I'm more concerned about that because then yeah. I think the process is not moving enough up into the head. And then after a, a session where we have the eyes good included, people will all often say, whoa, it's like I have widescreen now. Uh, <laughs> before, it was my vision was much more limited, but now it's like a television having widescreen. Uh, and this makes totally sense for me. To, uh, I, I have felt it also myself uh, doing eye works that, that you suddenly see clearer, you see more, you see more details, uh, you see the colors clearer and so on. I was actually like improves the vision itself. It, it can. Yes. Yes. Wow. And now, now I'm starting to kind of get it. I, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but it's almost like the eyes are sort of are kind of gauged to the power uh, or the force or the, I don't know, velocity or what, I don't know what the word is um, for how, um, how much the TRE is, is working. It's almost like, Oh, the eyes are moving. Okay. Th- we got a lot of, a lot of power behind this one. Um, and if the face isn't moving, it's like, well, maybe, maybe we don't need to crank it up. You know, <laughs> it's almost like, oh, maybe yeah. it's not cranked up enough. They're, it's not hitting them enough. Or yeah, maybe they're, or maybe they're just not ready for it yet because it, it, it is an overwhelming emotional uh, experience. It's tied to memories and emotions and all kinds of stuff like that. So maybe if, if you just sort of cranked up the, you know, uh, turn on the gas for someone in session one uh, and of course you can't do it it's up to them also um and yeah. their eyes are moving their face is moving they're just not ready for it maybe but um but lowers your point is like it seems like if things are kind of moving up here in the head then it's like oh something's going on uh, it's almost like a gauge a sort of measurement of like ah what's going on everywhere else yeah uh, yes and no and in a way you answered the question yourself <laughs> and i agree with your answering <laughs> <laughs> that kind of bad habit. I, I, I'm supposed to ask questions, but I just like, <laughs> yeah, but it's good. Uh, I agree. And <laughs> and um, it, yes and no because uh, it, I totally agree with some people. It can be too strong to have in a theory process to have uh, to have the face and the eyes along. So I would wait some month uh, before I introduce it uh, till they feel safe and they can they can um, integrate it and but you can also have others where there's a lot of things going up on here but the lower part of the body is not reacting so i wouldn't say that uh, it's the only it's the only way of seeing that it's a a good process because there are many other things to look at also but for me it's just important to have along in a tempo that the person can can integrate and feel comfortable with and then in theory it's something i added more emphasis on uh but i i work also with psychotherapy and there i work much more with the eyes uh so when i do psychotherapy 
I, I do all kind of work where the client is looking at my eyes and uh, trying to express emotions toward my eyes or just having eye contact, uh, all kind of stuff to, uh, to work with the ability to, uh, to have emotions in the eyes. Oh, let's do, let's talk about that. Yeah. So before we've been talking about like one nervous system, one person's eyes, um, just like looking off into space or in the wall or wherever, but now we're having two nervous systems, two people together, um, four eyes instead of just two eyes. Yeah. Um, how does this all change when you bring basically two people into it? It's not just a one person thing anymore. Like you're, you're looking at each other. Yeah. Then it, of course it, it, Many things happen. It it get it gets from a more somatic methods into a psychotherapeutic method, and it gets into a very effective psychotherapeutic method because you work with some of the major problems in the person, uh, and you can go down and and do very very early work very quickly. So many people will experience that suddenly they are two years old, like Alexander Lonix experience with Wilhelm Reich so suddenly you can move very quickly into these very early tra uh, childhood trauma and people re-experience uh, things that happened to them uh, and mainly in, in regard of their parents so it has two functions it reactivates this uh, these old themes you have the ability to express the emotions which was not able to express back then because you were th too threatened or the parents couldn't contain these emotions. And at the same time, you have hopefully uh, a safe therapist, uh, a therapist which can give love uh, instead of just being threatening. Uh, so in this way, you have also a repairing situation. And many other methods work with that also. What I feel is important in this early work is the ability to be present. And you are maybe re-experiencing things from when you were two years old, but at the same time, you feel adult and present in the room. Of anything we've talked about today, this I can feel the, your answer in my body like, whoa. This is a powerful, powerful tool. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's something that I, I would, I would, I think I would really benefit from. But it would be—it's almost like scary because you're like going straight in, um, not with a knife, but you're kind of boom, just barging the door down, and you're going straight to it. Because it seems like so many of our um, our fears and our traumas and our our um, the reason we are kind of stuck in the way we're stuck is is about the outside world and it's specifically other people, it's relationships, it's can we trust other people? Are we scared of them? Exactly. Oh, oh, that's a, when you, when you have to look into someone else's eyes and it's like with psychotherapy and it's this kind of deliberate kind of thing going on. It's not just a casual, Hey, how's it going? And you have to sort of face this, this fear or this face other people basically directly. It's not like through a middle ground. It's like, this is, this is an actual person looking at you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. How powerful, but how, Wow, that's great. And, and when you say it, it feels threatening also. It's an important important statement because that is some of the critic on Wilhelm Reich was that he was working too aggressively, that he was working too fast, uh, that some people, they were totally overwhelmed by the work. So that's where we learned a lot from, uh, for, for example, Stephen Porteous, which you also talked about, that we have to create mm -hmm. a, a safe space. Uh, this work doesn't make sense if if it's not happening in a tempo you can integrate, which is not happening in a way where you feel better when you leave the office than when you got in. Uh, if you leave the therapeutic office totally uh, overwhelmed, it doesn't make sense. So you have to find a tempo uh, in which the client feels safe. And I'm happy you say this, that it could feel threatening because that is a problem. The child was threatened. So the question is, how do we meet this child inside the client uh, in a way w which is respectful, which is safe, which is loving, but also where we give the client the ability to re-experience these old traumas to heal them? 
So the psychotherapist has a lot of responsibility to uh, um, be in a sort of safe social state um, because you can imagine like if, if this tool got in, in the wrong hands and I guess it does out on the streets, people use their eyes and they look at people and they traumatize them and they, they cause problems. You know, what if, um, yeah. I don't know, some, some uh, psychopath, narcissist, serial killer guy uses tool on somebody, you know, now that, that can, that'll destroy you. And that's what, that's what parents are doing sometimes to their kids and uh, unintentionally um, sometimes, but yeah, the, the power of another person's eyes who that can heal you or that can, that can kill you. But wow. But it, it can, it can also do the opposite. Yeah. It can give you pleasure and joy and st streaming yeah. sensations in your body. Uh, it's one of the main tools for uh, giving and receiving love. And it gets straight to it. Cause if you, if we can overcome this sort of fear of other eyes and we learn how to dance with other eyes and think, wow, I, I feel yeah. safe making eye contact with you. You can look at me and I can yeah. talk about this while I'm looking at you and you're not going to hurt me. How, yeah. cool, how much that can solve. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And you can't just, you can't just, this isn't something you could buy at the store exactly because um, you don't want to get the wrong one, the wrong eyes. Because um, you don't know if it's poison or if it's uh, medicine. Wow. I guess we have to find someone we love and someone we trust and we can, okay. Assuming we have someone we, we love and trust. Um, what are some things we can do with our eyes? I guess we do it naturally. We just look at each other, but I don't know, maybe you got some, something more deliberate, um, kind of exercise or something we can do to, uh, improve our nervous system to help calm ourselves down or help us feel more connected is it just simple gazing, just looking at each other uh, in, in sort of a safe way? It, it, how, how much of a mechanistic? It can be a nice exercise with your partner, for example, to yeah, just yeah. sit and look at each other and have good, nice eye contact. Uh, and all all the different kind of exercises I cannot go into because it's such a big area and it's so difficult yeah, to communicate over a podcast. <laughs> I know. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to crack open your toolkit and you're not budging. I understand your curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. What, could, could we do it with ourselves? Like, what is there any kind of mirror kind of exercise we can do? Like, look at our. It's not. It's not really the same, is it? It's kind of like tickling yourself. Doing a mirror, it, 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 it's complicated yeah. because then you see yourself. Yeah, this doesn't work. Uh, instead of the other one. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to cheat. I, I'm trying to cheat, trying to get around this because I don't have anyone to, to do this with. No, I'm kidding. Um. Anyway, yeah. Wow. We learned about. We talked about TRE. We talked about the connection with with the eyes. Um. I, we I didn't crack into that toolbox, but I'm gonna maybe make make a little make one myself. Maybe that'll be a future episode. Um but we learned a lot more than I had hoped. So this is great. I know all of your lessons that you do are mostly in Danish, right? All your stuff in Danish? No, no, I, I do. Uh, I do also some, uh, some webinars in English. Okay. Sometimes. But mainly, mainly Danish, but you do some, yeah. in, you do some in English. Okay. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, how can people connect with you or learn more about all this work? Yeah. Do do you put uh, if you put the um, homepage uh, information and so on, you can put my homepage yeah. on on the podcast. Okay, I'll put I'll put the homepage on there. It's it's in Danish, but there there's my contact information, so there there's my email address. Any other general resources um, that you think people would enjoy if they um, they want to learn more about William Reich, more about uh, bioenergetics or TRE or anything like this is there any sort of it's like ooh, this is a great anything yeah i have a youtube channel uh so if you yeah. if you youtube my full name michael maureen nissen uh then you will yeah. you will find my youtube channel uh and this is uh mainly for tre but there there you will see some uh testimonials from people with multiple sclerosis who have done tre and you will also have me uh, guiding two people with multiple sclerosis through the TRE process and one, the one where there's no physical limitations, this can be used by anyone. And if, if you don't have multiple sclerosis, you can just uh, do it anyway and just close your ears when I say multiple sclerosis. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. I will link all that up. I'm not very good at saying goodbye. It's always weird, like, goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. But uh, <laughs> let's try to do a strong one. How, how do you how do you say a strong goodbye? Uh, or like a normal one, not a weird one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> listen, yeah. listen to me. You do it. You do it. You're welcome. And uh, thank you for the invitation. It was nice to meet you. And thank you for the interest in my work and also uh, in theory and Russian work, bioenergetics, and on the emphasis on the eyes. And I was happy to be invited because I could see that you you work, you you want to take good care of our brain. Uh, and this is so connected to the eyes. So thank you for the invitation. It was nice to talk with you. Yeah, and sorry if I, I kept pushing onto the eyes more than maybe you wanted to. No, it is fine. I think I think we 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 landed in a good position. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael, and I hope uh, to stay in touch. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.